You're listening to A Pleasure Podcast, a podcast network revolutionizing the conversation around sex and relationships. For more, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. This episode is sponsored by Manscaped.com. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools and products for below the belt grooming. You can use promo code MULTI, M-U-L-T-I, for free shipping and 20% off at Manscaped.com. If you're busy all the time, that's not a marker that you're successful. If you're busy all the time, it means that you're actually failing at planning. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're tackling something a little different for our show, but that's still connected to relationships, and that is scheduling, productivity, and intentionality. It's so common to hear polyamorous people say that scheduling is the hardest part of their relationships. And in monogamous relationships, scheduling can still be a point of contention or stress. So in this episode... We're going to talk about some of our favorite scheduling and productivity hacks while also exploring ways to do this by prioritizing what actually matters to us and not just getting sucked into the cult of productivity. Ooh, the cult of productivity. Did you come up with that turn of phrase? I I did, yeah. Thank you. Wow. Did you really? Wow. (laughs) That's impressive. Well done. That's hard hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do feel that many of us could probably be in therapy for years just talking about scheduling and our feelings about productivity. <laughs> oh, no. Personally. <laughs> it definitely has become a big thing these days. <clears throat> I, I feel as though there's a lot of like podcasts and books written about productivity and like how to be more productive. For and sure. if you're not productive, blah, 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 then you're a bad person. Well, it's like a push-pull now between... I do feel that our generation is pulled toward, yes, be productive, maximize efficiency, but then also pulled toward, no, 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 you need to have self-care. You need to take a break. You need to relax. Like, it's okay. And I don't get a sense from our culture that we found a good balance with that yet. I just Mm -hmm. see it kind of us constantly being pulled back and forth between those two extremes, personally. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But what about our personal experiences Uh, with scheduling? Yes. (laughs) Talk about schedules. Um, Yes. So times that I've been frustrated. Let's start with when I've been frustrated with other people's schedules, shall we? Yes. Um, Lay it on us. For what comes to mind. Okay. What comes to mind for me is, okay, I'm a very schedule oriented person. Very, very much so. That was very much my family of origin. The patriarch of my family was very German. And so it was like, everything is on time. You know, like half an hour before time is on time. Showing up somewhere on time means that you're Right. And, you know, the number of hours of my life and my childhood spent sitting in a car because we showed up to an event an hour ahead of time. And now we're just going to sit in the parking lot (laughs) before the doors even open. I can't even tell you probably entire years of my life spent that way. Um, (laughs) So that's that's who I am. So that means the times that I get the most frustrated are any times I've dated a partner who's not a schedule oriented person and someone who's very much like, Hey, you want to hang out this afternoon? You know, and they message mm. me like two hours beforehand and that I just can't handle. So I, that's when I tend to get frustrated is, is when I can't, I can't fly. I can't jive with someone who's not as schedule oriented as I am. It's, huh. it's funny because now, Jace, I, you're looking at me very, yeah, you know, very she's done that to me a couple times sort of though, before. No, I know. I'm giving you a look because I remember in the early days of us dating that it was very much kind of like I had to wait for you to kind of be like, hey, I've got a, an evening free. Like it was kind of had to be ready for those last minute things. Were you just hating it? Is well, that, I guess I was more just... of an ass. I was probably just more of an asshole back then. I don't know. <laughs> were, were you really? Yeah, it was no, prob- I have, I don't I have know. a distinct memory of, was... of having to kind of like that. I couldn't really plan ahead. You were always sort of like, well, I've got to kind of see when I'm available and. 
you know. Jeez. Well, I don't know. What excuses can I come up with? Probably. <laughs> Quick. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, probably the pr- the main excuse being that I was in a much more hierarchical relationship back then yeah. where it was much more expected that like the leftover time is what goes to the secondary partner. You know, I'm pretty sure um, that's what it was. Right. So it's probably y'all. mostly that of like, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to nail down like the time that I need to give to my primary partner. And then I can tell you that's probably what it was. Yeah, I think yeah. that, that which sounds is, about Which right. is me partially yeah. shifting the blame onto my primary partner at the time. So. <laughs> right. And that's all right. We can blame him. OK, Emily, what baggage you got to work out with me? <laughs> Oh, no, no. It was just funny that you said that because I do remember fairly uh, recently when you were like, hey, I've got some time and I'm working like from home today. Do you want to like come up and work with me? And we ended up actually just like going to a bar slash food oh, right. place we just and ended like up drinking a hanging out and drinking <laughs> for like a couple hours, which was actually <laughs> awesome and like much preferred to like working, but maybe not the most productive thing. But I really enjoyed that. And it so wasn't. I'm surprised... Yeah, I mean, that was fairly spontaneous. So I think, like, for you to say, like, I am so rigid in this and I hate being spontaneous or whatever, I'm like, nah, yeah, you, you're you not as rigid as you think you are. Oh, okay, all right, all right, yeah. I'll take that, I'll take and that. I guess for myself, like, when I've been a little upset, it's mostly when I'm upset with partners when their schedule, like, makes them, when their schedule is so hectic that it makes them, like, kind of down or upset or like Mm. overwhelmed when they get home and i'm like well okay it seems like you like don't want to be around me or do much with me or whatever and then i'm like well eh, that kind of sucks so that's more when like my partner's schedules have frustrated me in the past yeah how about you jace no i think uh, i mean all of those things i was going to move on to the next one about kind of other scheduling frustrations of being frustrated with your own schedule because for me, it's kind of the opposite of Dedeker in a way that oftentimes when I'm most frustrated with my schedule is when it's too scheduled, right? Is when I don't have the flexibility to, oh, this thing came up. Yeah, sure. I, I can shift things around and do that. Or I can, you know, that times in my life when I, I'm so wall to wall scheduled with commitments that I just don't have that flexibility or don't have enough time for myself that then it's also probably leads to what Emily was talking about. If that just like, I can't bring as much of myself to my relationships or to my friendships or anything. Cause I'm just sort of like, ah, like any time I spare time I have, I'm like, what can I cram into this time instead of getting to actually enjoy it? So it's, it's, that's something that I feel like at least for me in recent memory comes up more often is when I'm too scheduled where I don't have unscheduled time. Yeah, there was a time in my life a couple of years ago, I'm sure that I talked about it on the podcast, but I had three restaurant jobs. I was working like a um, job for this guy where I was kind of doing personal assistant work for him. I would sometimes like do jobs for Nintendo. I was caroling during this at one point too. Yeah. And it was just like so unbelievably much that, you know, and then also multi amory on top of that. So I I just, yeah, I remember like basically having time for nothing else ever. And it did put a big strain on my relationship and definitely like also made me feel as though I was being, you know, I was working so hard and doing so much and had time for nothing else. But like overall, it was just like a stupid waste of time and not what I really needed to be doing. And it was too bad that I decided, like, I, I just like didn't utilize the word no in the way in which I should have. Um, I kept saying yes to a bunch of different jobs and, and I, it just was not good for my mental health. You've gotten way, way better at that though. Yeah. yeah, I think I have, I have. So how about, um, how about the other, let's see, just like how is like poor scheduling in general, just more, you know, whether it's ours or someone else's. How has it negatively affected our lives overall? I guess for me, I mean, as I just said, poor scheduling in terms of like over scheduling mm-hmm. has made me I uh, feel way too stressed and upset and exhausted and not able to like think or function properly. Yeah, I think the funny thing is that when I hear poor scheduling, my initial reaction is or the initial thing that I think of is, oh, someone who doesn't schedule anything or doesn't manage their schedule, that's poor scheduling. But I think it we've hit upon this point that poor scheduling can be scheduling too much. Yeah. 
You know, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that you're just like so great at scheduling that you schedule everything down to a T, but it can be that you, you don't take care of yourself within that scheduling. That's definitely where it's fallen for me for sure is that I tend to schedule too much. I tend to bite off too much or I tend to project having much more energy than I actually am going to have on a particular day and just fill up a day and just run myself ragged by the end of the day or the end of the week. I wish the listeners could hear me just rolling my eyes with like, yeah, that's so classic. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Hey, we've been working on that together. We have. It's yeah. good. It's been, you've, it's you've been, been getting better. Me. It's great. It's yeah. been good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think like for myself, I'm, I'm kind of on the extreme ends of both of these things because I do find myself like, I'm I'm getting ready to go to Shanghai by the time that uh the this episode comes out I'll already have been there but I'm trying to like remember because I don't write it down generally like I'm trying to remember all of the things that I need to get done before mm. I leave and I don't really write it down and so I'm just kind of sitting there being like okay like I have the Trello board for my multi amory tasks but then like the extraneous tasks that I have on my own I need to just like figure out what they are and it does tend to make me more anxious. And so I'm either like I fill up my day with work or I like don't know what I'm supposed to do and then I have to like try to figure it out by like going back in my brain and figuring it out somehow. I, I it's don't terrible. know. How can you live that way? How can you live that way? Like just I've hearing that makes years. me anxious. I but know. it's like, okay, dude, Alex, my partner Alex, I saw his Google calendar the other day. And there's like nothing on it. No, me neither. And I was just like, how? (laughs) How do you do this? He he has to do lists. Remembering dates. Like, oh, you are good at remembering dates. I'm phenomenal at remembering dates, and so I remember like specific days of things that like my other partners have told me, and they're you know that Josh is like, I am doing this thing on this day, or my mother is coming into town on this day, and I'm like, I've got it. Don't worry. When you forget, because you will, I will remember. So <laughs> I remember things like that, mm. but my own shit that I need to figure out, I'm like, I'll, I'll remember it sometime. Yeah. See, that also, because, uh, yeah, I have, like, to-do lists and, like, an entire Trello board just for organizing my life. And it's a good thing, actually. Incorporating the Trello bar- board really helped me to not just have one single long to-do list that's always there, but still, I just... I don't know how people do it without writing it down. So I feel like what's cool about this is just from sharing our personal experiences, I feel like we've already covered a lot of the range where it's not just saying like this one way of scheduling is good or that scheduling always has to look a certain way or that bad scheduling is always X, right? That there is a range and that's kind of what we want to get into in this episode, right? That's why I was excited to propose this topic for this episode, because it's something that I feel like um, it, it takes a balance and it takes learning about a lot of different things, you know, to, to figure out, like, how does the schedule serve you? Yeah, definitely. And this topic in general is really popular. Of course, we're not the first people to ever cover this. If you do a search for scheduling or productivity, you're going to find zillions of articles and apps and books just on that subject alone. Um, But the trap uh, is that you can sometimes prioritize efficiency or productivity for its own sake, you know, falling into that cult of productivity, yeah, no, that's as amazing. Jace <laughs> mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. But I think it is important that we should step back and take a look at the bigger picture. Yeah, this is really important because there is this central idea behind scheduling and efficiency that it should be there to improve the quality of life for everyone involved. So, you have to ask yourself when you look at something like this, like what does quality of life actually look like for you? What mm. is important? Mm. And mm. this is I a good question. Be like, ah, oh, amen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just because, again, like maybe like my my schedule, like being you know written down to a T, is like actually not that important to me. <laughs> and maybe like uh, just trying to figure it out and and try to implement it in the ways that I do is more important. But I don't know, like productivity, that seems like something that's really important to you, Dedeker, or like a good, healthy, well-nuanced schedule. A well-nuanced schedule. (laughs) (laughs) 
And James, I mean, I've seen your bullet journal. Damn, like that thing's super impressive too. Like I feel like you, you are really impressive at scheduling as well. Well, and we're going to get to that later toward the end of the episode. So so we're going to talk more about those specific tools. Yeah. So what else are like things that are important to y'all well, and like, that improve your quality Like of life. for mine, the unstructured time, having free time, having the flexibility to say yes to opportunities that come along, like that's something that's important for me. And if I were listening to some scheduling guru who's telling me to schedule every minute of my day to be the most productive, that's not going to serve that goal. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, to me, what's really important to me in my life is it's really important for me to have clear leisure time, which is different from necessarily free time, but just like clear leisure time, like clear how it to be clear to me when my working hours end, because something that I find myself actually getting envious of pretty frequently among my friends or partners who have more traditional nine to five jobs is that often for these people, they go to work and they're there at work eight hours a day. And then when they come home, it's very clear. Okay. That's, whatever time it's yeah. relaxing time it's leisure time i leave my work at work and then i come home of course not everyone has a job a nine to five where they can leave their work at work and for those of us like myself who are self-employed or an entrepreneur you can't always leave your work at work you know because your success of your business or your project or whatever is directly tied to how much work you're putting into it and so for me it is really important to give myself that gift of okay, this is the time, whether it's the weekend or after six o'clock or whatever it is, where it's okay to just relax and feel okay about it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So that's part of having a high quality of life for me. What else? I think it's really important to do, um, I mean, you put this on yours, like self-improvement time, but like, for instance, it's incredibly important for me to go to yoga at least like two to three times a week. And to me, like, that is, like, my, I don't have, like, a regularly scheduled meditation, but, like, that is my meditation time to me. And it always, like, has been basically for the entire time that I've known you, Dedeker, like, the last six years. And it also is, you know, today, for example, I had a rough day at work at my restaurant job yesterday. And I was, you know, hemming and hawing, like, should I go to yoga today? Should I go? And I went (laughs) <laughs> and I felt so much better. It was amazing. Um, and I knew that, yeah, this is a time for me to decompress, not only decompress, but also uh, it, it, do some exercise, which, you know, ra- raises your endorphins and makes you feel better in a variety of ways. And so all of those things are really important to me. So there are like very specific times within the week where I know that I can make that a priority. Yeah. So with all of this, Kind of the the message here is to evaluate where you're spending your time. Like what is it that you want your schedule to give you? Like what what is the purpose of your scheduling or your productivity or any of this? And part of that might be being willing to let go of some things. Being willing yeah, to like three restaurant jobs. <laughs> right. Like being willing to say no to some things might mm-hmm. be it for you. Or it could be making it so you're able to say yes to more things like that. It really depends. And and it's important to just be honest with yourself, like really get honest with yourself about what, what do I want? What's the purpose of this rather than just going, Oh, well, someone says I should do this thing to be productive. I should do that. Right. So with that in mind, later on in the episode, we're going to cover some kind of specific tools and things like bullet journal that we've personally found to be really helpful But first, we want to talk about four big kind of game-changing topics in terms of productivity. And the first of those, may surprise you, is sleep. So Mm. sacrifice sleep, right? (laughs) Sleep is the first thing to go. (laughs) First thing to go. Well, I think for a lot of people it is, myself included. That's like the easy thing to be like, well, I'll just sacrifice that by getting up a little earlier, staying up late. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I notice that when I'm getting less sleep, that's a clear indicator to me that I need to be better about my schedule and not just in the sense of like, oh, I need to get to bed on time, but it's more of looking at it holistically that for me, it's like, oh, if I'm 
have getting to bed late, that usually probably means that I've worked too late. And so then I've been like, well, I want to do something fun for a change today, or I want my decompression time, decompression time or whatever. I don't want to just go straight to bed after working all day. And so then I stay up a little too late decompressing. And then it's like this domino effect where everything continues to, to just get knocked over. So I've been trying to be better about that recently of like, when I'm consistently not getting enough sleep, knowing that like, okay, that's a clue I need to sit down and like, rearrange my schedule or refigure out my schedule so that this doesn't just keep happening or I need to reprioritize like quitting work earlier or mm. playing more video games or something like that. Yeah. That, that's Always. my that's my very circuitous way of justifying that playing more video games will equal high, equal higher quality sleep for myself. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> where the research is there, but yeah, you know, by all it's, means, you know, research body of one. Um, so <laughs> benefits of sleep, of course, sleep is so 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 important. I know everyone wants to tune this out. Everyone's rolling their eyes, but seriously, it's just so many more things than you even realize. It's not even just your energy throughout the day or your zest for life. It's also your ability to learn things, your ability to memorize things, your metabolism, your weight, uh, your ability to keep yourself safe and be vigilant, your mood, huge one, your mood, your cardiovascular health, your immune system, everything is so tied to sleep. It's a really frustrating thing because sleep researchers can't even give us a clear answer as to why all these things are tied <laughs> yeah. up in your sleep. We need to, we need to <laughs> rest. Just, we need to recharge. They just know that we do. They, all we know is we need to recharge our batteries. It's not we good need your brain to shut don't. the fuck up for a while. Yes. yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Gosh, yes. yeah. And, and with sleep... Okay, <clears throat> let's let's be really real about what getting enough sleep means. And enough can vary from person to person, but it's probably more than you think it is, number one. Uh, and then basically that's that the range for adults is seven to nine hours, somewhere in that range. It's definitely not less than seven. I want to be clear on that, um, that it's in this seven to nine range. And what's interesting is, if you're younger, it's more actually like teenagers should be getting like eight to 10, which is God, the, was, I used to go to bed at like 3 a.m. or like 2 a.m. and then get up at like what, like six or seven. Oh, to, yeah. I know it was insane. Oh, yeah. When, no when, when I yeah. was in high school, I got up at 530 in the morning to go to jazz band before school yeah. and, you know, would still stay up late in the evening because I would also have like rehearsal after school totally. and then if I played a sport during certain seasons would do that and then come home have to do homework have some you played sports relaxing time I played a, a little bit of sports <laughs> did some Whoa. some track and field and some soccer <laughs> well, we'll, we'll not get into that um <laughs> okay but right so I did those things and then would go home and you know I need to have homework time and then relaxation time and then get to sleep and I was you know probably getting maybe six hours of sleep a night on a good day. I was probably usually yeah. getting less than that. And in high school was when I first started being like, I think I might have depression. Like I, I was, mm. I had a, a hard time at times, even though I was doing stuff I loved and had a good family situation and like a lot of stuff was going for me, but just really would struggle sometimes. And looking back on it, I'm just like, God, I wish someone had been like, stop. Like you, you just have to sleep Get your butt in bed. that it, it makes a difference. And I don't want to say like sleep's the cure for depression, but not sleeping can cause it or anxiety or other things like that's been shown. That is very clear. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to cover too about sleep research is that, um, some of you may have heard there's this thing, the term is super sleeper is kind of the term that gets thrown Which around. Which is funny. It's like the opposite of like being a, a super sleeper. You right. sleep less <laughs> if you're a super sleeper. Yeah. So a super sleeper is this term for people who have genetically been shown they only actually need four or five hours of sleep a night. It's very rare. This is a very rare trait to have. Um, and that a lot of people, the researchers have found that the, actually the majority of people who self-identify as one of these super sleepers are not actually. And that actually they're just operating on a daily basis in an impaired state and they're not aware of it because the thing that's measuring if they're impaired, their brain is impaired. Is impaired. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like that whole like, oh no, I'm not drunk. I'm fine. Because your drunk brain is trying to tell if you're drunk or not. Right? <laughs> it's that mm. kind of, it's that kind of thing. And basically the way they put this out there to tell is 
if you say, oh yeah, I'm fine on five hours of sleep a night or four hours of sleep a night, if you ever have a night where you do sleep nine hours or 10 hours, like if you ever have a day where you sleep in a bunch, you're not a super sleeper. Like it literally having mm. that genetic trait means you never need more than that much sleep. And that's very few of us. So even you who think you don't need that much sleep, I would bet a lot of money that if you Thank actually you. did some tests and measured that and then started getting more sleep, that you would, that the increase in productivity and mood and functioning and health and everything would be so much greater than what you think you're gaining by not sleeping, right? By, by spending that right. extra time doing something else. So our beloved adamandeve.com is this week's sponsor. Um, and we really love them just simply because they have been with us since the beginning of Multiamory. Uh, and that's awesome. We love like Brand relationships? No, I'm kidding. But we just love them. They're awesome. Uh, and if you are in a relationship, you might be having sex. And so you might need some sexy things. And because of that, why don't you go to Adam and Eve and grab some sexy things? I like sexy how you're walking people like... through the whole like logical process of... <laughs> exactly. Of... No, just in case. You know what? I'm going to spell it all out for you. Uh, <laughs> so you might want to get some sexy clothing, some like lingerie. Get a little sexy candle, sexy <laughs> toy, and maybe some sexy porn. You can get all of these things, even condoms, at adamandeve.com. So if you were looking for something that maybe is a little expensive, a little out of your price range, you can use our promo code MULTI, M-U-L-T-I, at checkout. You can actually use it as many times as you want. Get a bunch of really expensive things and knock 50% <laughs> right off of that. Um, you'll also get a free gift and free shipping when you use our promo code. So definitely go and do that. Go to adamandeve.com, use MULTI, and then it'll also give us a nice little kickback, and we will love you even more than we already do, and Adam and Eve for that matter. Yeah. So the next productivity hack, um, it's not even a hack, it's just like a thing that you need to be doing, <laughs> is reading an exercise. So yeah, Jace wanted me to talk about this because you're, he was like, you're really good at both of these things, which I very much appreciate. But yeah, I do I do try to prioritize reading and exercise. Um, but do you do it at the same time? Then I would say you're really good at so it. So <laughs> I, read, I read every day before bed. Like pretty no, much but I mean, fail. do you read and <laughs> do yoga at the same time? Yeah. No, I do not. That would be... <laughs> well, that's the next level. I don't know that's how the next you thing would... to aspire to. No, no I'm not going to aspire no. to that. Like your brain <laughs> needs to do things fully and separately. The, I, Thank I you. firmly believe in that. I firmly believe in that. But yeah, no, I do really try to read before bed every single night. And it's so fantastic. Like it helps you get to bed. It also helps you just learn new things. And I think both of you are great about reading as well. And that's wonderful. But if it's a novel, if it's a memoir, if it's, you know, something else, a nonfiction book or something along those lines, just like read, you're gonna, it, it's amazing for your brand. It's amazing for your whole holistic and, you know, happiness and, and everything. It's great. And well, then, okay, I, have a, yeah. I have a quick question about this. And Jace, Please. maybe you, you found more about this in your research. Like, because I know for some people, you know, people who are maybe not neurotypical or maybe have dyslexia or stuff like that, reading is not necessarily like the super easy leisure activity that a lot of people Audiobooks? have. Yeah. So is it more about just the like getting the knowledge, getting the information or, or like what's the kind of key about this? Yeah, actually, this is something that's really cool. And I was actually very excited to find out about this. But um, in there was some research done, and I unfortunately did not plan for you to ask that question. So I didn't write down who this research was done by. But um, there has been research about kind of the there's lots of studies showing the positive effects of reading in terms of things like they help us with our social relationships and they help us with various sorts of intellectual processing and problems and things like that. And one of the, one of the potential explanations for that is, and this is specifically reading actually fiction is what these studies are about, is that reading fiction, part of what might be giving us those benefits is putting ourselves in the shoes of the characters in the book, as well as keeping Love track that. 
of the different social relationships between that person and the other people in the book, like between all of those people. And what they found in this research is that the benefits were exactly the same listening to an audio book versus reading a book. So it's, hmm. there's not this so magic just like thing your brain, of... I yeah. see. So it's just like your brain kind of keeping track of this information and specifically this socially relevant information. And sort of the imagining that goes with it. The the sort of imagining yourself in those situations or trying to imagine the feelings or those situations and things like that, that that's the key part of it. And so whether that's an audio book or a written book, doesn't matter. You get the same yeah. benefits. That's wow. awesome. Okay. So good to know that if you really want to do like gold medal level try reading the tale of genji because there's like over 100 characters in that freaking book <laughs> whoa <laughs> yeah yeah i mean even reading like game of thrones right. or like <laughs> oh tolkien, yeah that too that yeah too. tolkien like any of those there are a ton of people in it yeah and that's huge yeah. and then yeah as we talked about before exercise is a big one uh it is it, it's just i i do believe that research has shown that it really is a cure not a cure but it helps get people out of depression and out of times in their life where they're, you know, just in a slump and not happy with themselves or not happy with what's going on. And it can really turn things around in that manner, just simply from the physical benefits of it. And it leads into the mental benefits as well. Yeah. And whatever exercise works for your body also. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, if you want to swim, if you want to do yoga, if you want to hike, if you just want to, you know, do circuit training or weight training, anything, anything can be huge. I mean, I yeah. used to be a figure skater and it was big for me when I was a kid and it was wonderful, like getting to go on the ice and stuff and do that. And now it's yoga. So, but I mean, also if you're dealing with injury or illness or yeah. disability or things like that, just like whatever exercise it is that works for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And we want to be clear with all of this, like what I was saying about sleep and what Emily's saying about exercise, you know, this is not to say, oh, if you have any kind of depression or anxiety or something, that this is the cure and you shouldn't be doing something else. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying that, um, that, it's this, helpful. that this would be something that would help in addition to mm -hmm. other things if you need those, right? So I, I just want to be clear about that. Um, and like, this is something my mom and I were talking about just recently for her um, with her health conditions right now, a lot of exercise she used to like to do is more difficult. And so it's kind of coming up with like, well, what does that look like then? It doesn't have to be hitting the gym. It doesn't have to be running, but just something to kind of engage your physical body, right? In, in whatever way that is for you. Uh, yeah. And then I also had one little quote that I wanted to leave us with here, which was something that actually my uh, voice teacher in high school said to me once where I was just really stressed about, you know, cause I was like in the, the musical and also was in my like AP classes and it was just like doing too much. Right. Like I said, and he asked me, he's like, are you reading? Are you making time to read? And I was like, no, I, I just, I don't have time. I, I like reading. I just don't have time to do it. And what he said is he's like, the times when you don't have time to read are the times it's most important to make time to read. And I was just like, Yeah. You're that right. goes with like yeah. most of the stuff. It goes stuff. with a lot of <laughs> the stuff. sleeping, the theme. The yeah. theme. sleeping, like we Exercise, talked about yeah. on a previous episode about date night, mm -hmm. about meditating, yeah. about I would say honestly even with like therapy things like that. That it's mm -hmm. like the times when busyness is getting in the way of these things. That's an indicator that like you need to make an extra effort. Yeah, right. You know to do these things so okay another of the one of the big four to bear in mind when you're figuring out your schedule figuring out your productivity is to place boundaries around your personal time or around your personal unstructured time now this is actually a compelling reason to choose to not share calendars with your partners i know that you know another part of polyamory PR is all about the like sharing Google calendars and we're all a slave to Google calendars, stuff like that. But you may <laughs> choose not to share your calendars with your partner. Um, if that makes it easier for you to be able to protect your own personal time. Um, there are some companies that are moving toward discouraging ca calendar sharing between employees or coworkers because they understand the importance of being able to have that undistracted, unstructured time to get your work done instead of it just being on display for anyone to take, you know, make a meeting or, or, 
Oh yeah, yeah. free time. Yeah, I'm getting. I'm gonna it. use some. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I ran into this years ago when I was still kind of playing around with monogamous dating. Still kind of. Um, yeah, this guy that I was dating. Where yeah, we got into a lot of conflict over the fact that I really valued a lot of free personal time and unstructured personal time. And for him, it was kind of the opposite of like, well, if you have free time, we're going to spend that together, you know, and like, I don't want to have to no, ask no. <laughs> for your time, which I understand where he's coming from that like, sure, maybe it's annoying to always, always constantly having to be schedule with your partner. Um, but yeah, I just had a hard time feeling like, okay, now that we're in a relationship, my schedule is just like, I'll hand it over to you. And then I have to try to ask back for my own alone time mm. or free time or stuff like that. That was, that was a rough lesson for me to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think very clear. Although, no, I, I do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Although no, I do share calendars with my partners and so far it hasn't, I don't know, hasn't turned into an issue of people trying to take all my free time necessarily. I mean, you could put like in big block letters, me time only <laughs> or something. Well, yeah, like, get actually, out of here. I, I did want to say that I've come across kind of a couple different philosophies for that. And it kind of depends on what works for you when you look at your own schedule, your own calendar, and also how you negotiate that with the people in your life. But for some people, it is like I put a block of schedule in my calendar that is this is my time that's not structured. <laughs> Like I'm structuring the fact that this is not structured time and this is my time. And for some people that really helps almost, it can also help for yourself. So like I won't schedule things during my unstructured time. Like that can be really helpful. And for other people, it's, it's kind of the opposite where it's more like, I like to have chunks in my schedule that don't have anything written in them and that's important to me so with them it's like you got to educate people in your life just because there's a block here doesn't mean it's yours i i like these i need these to be here if you ever look at my schedule and you see there's not big chunks of not stuff scheduled then realize that's a problem and kind of be like "Ooh, mm -hmm. hey i want to help you get some of those back so it really really varies kind of whatever works for you yeah. I will say that since, I mean, so I share my calendar with both Jace and Alex. Uh, Alex, as previously mentioned, doesn't use Google Calendar all that much, but Jace does. And so I think that has been helpful, actually, in the sense that you notice when I seem to be overscheduled. <laughs> I do, yeah. For sure. That's true. You know that you can be like, whoo, boy, baby, like, what's going on here? Um, that that does help me to also be aware of it, <laughs> that you're... I don't know. I never intentionally set you up to like be my accountability buddy on that. And I wouldn't want you to like have that job necessarily, but I do appreciate that you're able to be a little bit of a voice mm -hmm. of reason sometimes to at least just observe like, Oh yeah, it looks like you got a real busy week there. Huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe I do. Yeah. Yikes. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yep. 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 So uh, this next one is one that is a real kick in the face for me, but one <laughs> that I maybe I'm better about now, but definitely in the past, I, I should have used and taken this advice, which is get over the glory of being busy, especially I feel in this in our current society. So many people just love to be like, oh, I'm so busy all the time. Yeah. And I just oh, I can't do anything ever. And I, I just am like work and, you know, class and. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm trying to get my PhD at the same time and also like maintaining seven different relationships. Wow, look at how amazing I am. And it, so, yeah, okay. This book, The Company of One, which the two of you have read, which I still need to, says right. this. The social badge of honor for always being busy and always working has no rewards past bragging rights. What you should be bragging about is figuring out how to get your work done quicker and more productively. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It. yeah. It's funny. It. Um, this uh, Our friend, the, the three of ours, our friend who is a patron of ours is at my house right now talking to my partner. And uh, she has said like, yeah, like my uh, I have a couple clients a month and that, I, you know, I'm hoping to like eventually get to a point where like I have one a month and it pays all of my bills and everything and I don't have to do anything more than that. And I'm like, wow, that is impressive and awesome. And then she can just like do what she wants the rest of the time. And that's really cool. That's wow. Yeah, I know. That, I can't even imagine. Palms, that makes my palms yeah. sweat a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Well, okay, just busy. I think there's a couple factors here that can really suck us into this idea of the glory of being busy. You know, one of them being that I think in Western culture and especially American culture, we're so taught that our productivity reflects our social worth, really, that yeah. if you're not being productive, you're not worthy of love or affection or attention or stuff like that. Like you need to earn your place in society. And so that means you need to be being productive all the time. Um, you know, which is, you know, capitalism and all that stuff. We can talk about that another time. But I think I've also realized that busyness, it does serve as a little bit of this insulator where if you're busy, it becomes easier to to not have people ask things of you. Mm. I think yeah. this is something that That's an has definitely happened to me. I've definitely observed it in friends and family members of mine that if my story about you is like you were just like busy and stressed out all the time, I'm not going to come to you to ask for a favor or to ask for help on something. And so that does kind of benefit you to a certain extent that if you can always hide behind, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. It does help you that instead of having to just say, no, I don't want to do that, you know, or no, I'm not interested in that, that you can just be, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. And I don't even have to navigate that. And so busyness yeah. can serve as like a really good insulator for us to a certain extent. You know? Yeah. I, I can't remember who it was, but there was someone um, who was, it was like someone else guesting on another podcast. And so I don't remember kind of the, the chain of custody for who actually said this. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but basically, they were talking about this idea. It was the first time I had heard this. And this was a couple years ago of this idea that <clears throat> I think the way that he put it was if you're busy all the time, that's not a marker that you're successful. If you're busy all the time, it means that you're yeah. actually failing at planning. And I was mm. just like, whoa. whoa, like reframing, like being busy as a failure rather than being busy as a marker of success. And that's not to say if you're busy right now, I think you're a failure. But right. for me, yeah. I was, I was going to say, failure. yeah, I don't want, I don't want anyone to get the message <laughs> that busyness is like, I don't want a victim blame on busyness sure. either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I do know that for myself at the time hearing that I was like, shit, you're right. I, I will kind of seek out busyness because I think I have to, because that's going to make me more successful. And And like Emily read in this quote, I think this is, a better way to say it, but this idea of the, the bragging about being busy is often like, that's the only value to it. And that really, like, if you can brag about finding ways to get stuff done more quickly, more productively and have less time that you're having to do stuff, that's something to really be like, wow, I figured that out. That's amazing. And something we should look at and go, that's so cool. I love that. And instead, I think it's, we judge it. You know, I've done it yeah. and I feel like a lot of people do that where we're like, mm, okay. And we're just like, you must be lazy or you must be, you know, too privileged or you must have something that gave you that that's not fair. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway, that, sometimes that, that's not the guess at all. That for me was a big thing. And anyway, on this podcast, the person talking about it was saying, he's like, I get a lot of emails saying, hey, I'm sure you're really busy uh, whatever, but I have this question or like, but I'd like help with this thing. And he said that his response is usually like, no, actually, no, I'm not busy. <laughs> sure. Let, I'll help you out. Or, or like, Oh, you know, sure. I'll help you out a little bit with this, but I've got to do these other things. But it kind of brings you to that point. Like Dedeker was saying of then if you just want to say no to something, you have to be honest and actually say no to the thing as opposed to mm. falling back on busyness as an excuse. And I think there's advantages to both. Sometimes it's convenient to say, oh, I'm really busy when you're not. I mean, that's, but it's also good to be know. like, no, I don't want to do this thing. <clears throat> yeah. No, think, it's not worth my time. That's, I think there's that's value an important, yeah. you know, distinction mm -hmm. to make. I would yeah, say maybe 100%. like, maybe the distinction would be about what is that relationship? You know, is mm -hmm. this, some coworker or some sort of random person coming to you asking for your time and for your favor, the, the old, like, can I pick your brain about this to maybe be like, Oh, I'm so, yeah. I'm so busy. Hey, I, can I get you a coffee? Right. Right. And maybe <laughs> yeah. it is, I'm, I'm just really busy. I don't have time for that because you don't want to get into it. But if it's with your friends or your romantic partners or something, then yeah, I think it's worth having a real conversation about I'm not busy but that's the point, right? That's yeah. the point is that I'm not busy and I want to keep it that way. You know, maybe that's 
or or just I don't want to do that thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's talk about some of our favorite tools for not only being productive, but also a little bit of schedule hacking. And uh, yeah, just kind of having your time be something that supports the life that you want to have. Like we talked about very early on in this episode, that it's not just about productivity for productivity's sake. It's not just about freeing up time to squeeze in as much things as possible, but it's about being able to focus so that you can focus on a particular project that you want to get done or on self-improvement or on deepening the relationships with your partner or with your partners or things like that. So we have a couple of tools here. This is definitely not an exhaustive list of tools for focus, for productivity, for scheduling. There are so, so, so many more. And we definitely love to hear from all of you about your favorite tools. But I'm going to start in talking about Pomodoro tomatoes. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> Have you never heard of this, Em? No, I don't know what this is, so please enlighten me. Do you know what a Pomodoro tomato is? I don't like tomatoes, so... Neither yeah, I don't like tomatoes either. <laughs> well, here we are, two tomato hating people. <laughs> yeah, well, the Pomodoro technique, it was developed several years ago, um, but it's basically just the idea that you set a timer, and traditionally it's a 25-minute timer, there is research around oh, that yeah, we interval did this. of time. We did this. Yeah, yeah, did this. yeah. We did this we when did we were this. planning our keynote talk in um, yes, that's right. Minneapolis. We did a Pomodoro, okay. a couple Pomodoros. Okay. Yeah, um, that you set a timer for twenty five minutes, and then during that twenty five minutes, you're only going to focus on one task. You know, whether it's writing a thing, or like us when we were writing our keynote speech, or working on, you know, clearing out your inbox or whatever it is and putting away your phone, putting away any other tabs or distractions or things like that. And that just for 25 minutes, you give your sole focus to what it is that you want to do. Then you get a little break, uh, like a three to five minute break to get up, go to the bathroom, get a glass of water, get a snack, move around, whatever. And Check then you your set text messages, do your social Check media. If you want to. Yeah. yeah. And then you go back for another 25. Um, you can play with the numbers. You can play with the timing. This is a technique I actually used in college a ton for writing papers. I actually split it up into like 15 minute chunks of focus with like three minute, two or three minute breaks in between. Mm. Um, but there is research around the 25 minute interval. And unfortunately, since JC, you were the one doing most of the research for this episode, I don't have sources necessarily right in front of me. I can probably look them up later. But But there has been research around there's something a little bit magical about 20 to 25 minutes for your brain, essentially, as far as like the amount of focus that you can give, like they find in conversations, topics tend to naturally change around the 20 to 25 minute mark, Mm. Um, that that's when there might be a lull in conversation that then moves on to something else. They find that meditating for 20 to 25 minutes, that that maximizes kind of the theta waves that you would get during the meditation session. Um, like we talked about a few episodes back with the halting, how the Gottmans found that it takes 20 to 25 minutes for your physiological uh, manifestations of anger or sadness or frustration. It takes that long for that to calm back down. So yeah. there's something about 20 to 25 minutes that has to do with just like, I don't know, something about just kind of like your circadian rhythm or something like that. I don't know what it is, but it's like a good chunk of time for focus. And it's a lot easier to focus for 20 to 25 minutes than to be like, okay, I'm going to focus for an hour with no distractions, unbroken. That's a lot harder for us to do. Um, I guess unless it's maybe a really compelling TV show. And even then <laughs> we still tend to check our phones. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I love that, especially for, because um, they have found ironically, that if you get distracted by something in the middle of a task, if you're working on a paper or a project and you get distracted by a text, by checking Twitter, by checking Facebook, by even going over and checking your email instead, it takes your brain 20 to 25 minutes to get fully focused back to what you were initially doing. Like that's literally how long it takes to get your brain kind of back on track and fully focused again and back up to speed and back in that state of flow. (laughs) I know, right? Um, So that's why I think it's great for if you're trying to just buckle down and get something done that often you can get a task done way faster than you normally do just when you dedicate actual chunks of focus to it instead of being distracted the entire time. Yeah. 
Hey gang, the episode that you're listening to today is sponsored by our lovely sponsor, Manscaped.com. Now you can use our special promo code, which is multi, M-U-L-T-I. If you make an order at Manscaped.com, you'll get free shipping as well as 20% off and you'll help support us as well. Yeah. So I know we've talked about it a number of times on this show, but I seriously can't say enough good things about the Lawnmower 2.0, which is their electric trimmer. Basically, what's cool about it is they totally sort of redesigned the way you approach an electric trimmer for using down there, right? Using in your private parts. So it's got these nick-free blades so that you're not going to cut yourself, that it's waterproof so you can do that in the shower to avoid mess, lots of things like that. And it's got this, it's got a nice texture to it. That's hard to explain, but it's got this (laughs) nice kind of like rubberized plastic texture that makes it nice and easy to grip. I really like it. Um, But what's cool is that it's also just good as a normal trimmer. So even if you were just in the market for like a beard trimmer or a trimmer for your hair or something, I actually recommend it for those too, even though they market it specifically for, you know, manscaping or genitalscaping. I don't (laughs) know. know. Crotchscaping? Crotchscaping. I like that. Yeah. And the holidays are coming up, so it's kind of the perfect time to grab one. In addition to that, they have the thing called the Perfect Package 2.0, which includes that lawnmower 2.0. So you can get that, plus the plow, which is their safety razor, um, the crop preserver, crop reviver, which are like little spritzes and sprays and deodorants for your your uh, nether regions, um, <laughs> then shaving mats, and a complimentary toilet bag. So... Those are great things to grab, definitely, for the holidays. Also, I can say from experience, uh, my partner uses the Crop Cleanser, which is the body wash, and it smells amazing, and I love it. So grab all of that uh, with the 20% off code. So again, you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code MULTI, M-U-L-T-I, and Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com, and use code M-U-L-T-I. So let's talk about Patreon. Patreon is an amazing community of people that we have kind of compiled over the years. Um, But honestly, you have just all come to us and it's been so wonderful to get to meet um, all of our patron members. So when you become a patron at the $5 level, you become uh, part of our private Discord chat server and our private Facebook group. But then if you go to the $7 level, you get access to weekly bonus episodes and ad free versions of our episodes. And then you also get them a day earlier. So all of those things are super great. Um, bonus episodes, something that's kind of near and dear to my heart because I know we all get a little bit more into personal stories uh, from each of us. I tend to cry a lot on them. So if you want to hear more of that, then <laughs> definitely true. tune in. Um, there's also things like extra questions for guests that we have on the show and then just even more in-depth information on the topic that we talked about um, during the show. So we would love it if you joined us at patreon.com slash multiamory. We love our patrons so much. We've learned so many amazing things from them about things that they want to hear about on the show, Uh, even just like giving us a community in a way that we never even thought was going to be possible when we started this show. But it's huge, and it's become such an amazing resource for us as well. So if you want to be a part of all that, and we would love you to join, again, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. And another thing that would actually help us a ton if this show is something that you like is to take a moment, maybe right now, and just go to iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review. Um, We have so many amazing reviews from our listeners, and I know it, it can sometimes seem like it doesn't matter, but it actually does. It makes a big difference, especially for podcasts that aren't owned by PRX or NPR or one of these huge companies. Like for us, like independent podcasts, those reviews are what make us show up in search results at all, basically. Not even just a hire, but show up at all is the fact that iTunes is able to see, hey, people are engaged with this. People like this enough to take a moment and write something about it. So it really does make a difference. And we really appreciate getting to hear what it is you get out of this show. Um, In particular, I've loved how our reviews were actually the first thing that kind of made us realize that there were people who were in a variety of relationships, who are in monogamous relationships, or who are relationship therapists who are using the things that we talk about on this show with their clients. 
Um, like those things are amazing, and we wouldn't have known that if people hadn't left those reviews. So if you haven't done it yet, we would love it so much if you just took a moment again to go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher and write us a review and let us know what it is you like about this show. Why do you listen to it? Why is this worth someone taking an hour of their time each week to listen to? Uh, we would appreciate that so, so much. And I look forward to reading them and probably getting teared up while doing so. Yeah. This is, So Pomodoros are something that I don't use on a regular daily basis, but I find that kind of like we did with the keynote, where it's just sort of like, I have to get this thing done, whether I'm in the mood to do it or whether I'm in the right headspace to do it or not. A Pomodoro is a really nice way to just be like, it's 25 minutes. I can handle 25 minutes, right? <laughs> like, I have to write this paper. I don't want to, but okay, I can do it for 25 minutes. And then I'll take a little break and then come back and be like, okay, I can, I can do one more 25 minutes. You know, like that's, that for me is when it's, this tool is really helpful. Also with the stuff we were talking about earlier with reading and with exercise, you know, yeah. that it's, it can be harder to squeeze into your schedule. Okay. I'll sit down and read for an hour, exercise for an hour, but sometimes 20 minutes. That's, like a, that's that a great example. A lot yeah. of people can do. Yeah. You sometimes know? I'll just do like a little circuit training while watching, you know, a YouTube funny video or something <laughs> in yeah. the middle of the day when I'm working on multi-amory stuff and it breaks up my day again. Yeah, that's great. Or read 20 minutes before I go to bed and help it have mm -hmm. me fall, fall asleep. That yeah. wasn't a yeah. sentence, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's the next one, Jace? Okay, the next one is bullet journals. And this is something you mentioned earlier in the episode, Emily, about looking at my Yeah, but I journal. still also don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 Terrible. Yeah. So Dedeker actually introduced me to bullet journals a year or two ago, something like that. And... The, uh, originally, this is really? something that you would do in Wasn't, a paper journal. Yeah, that's where I saw you do it initially, like back at the old house that we used to have, Jace. You you had a bullet journal way back then, but it was like right before. No, it was that was a different paper one. That was a different kind of journal. That wasn't a bullet journal. I don't remember what that was. It journal? was something else, or a six minute journal, or something. Yes, that was different. Oh, okay. That Sorry, was different. The six minute journal was different. Also great. Do recommend check, check that out if you're into that. Um, no, so the bullet journal originally started on paper journals, but now there's a lot of different electronic ways to do it as well. Um, but what's cool about it is that the premise of it is simple enough that really any way you want to do it works, whether that's in a, you know, a spreadsheet or a document or Dedeker does hers on a Trello board, which is a free service, Trello.com. I do mine on a Workflowy journal, which is Workflowy.com, also a thing that's free for most users. Um, but basically the way it goes is you just make one uh, list or one page or one bullet or whatever for each day in a month. Right. So for every day you have one page in your journal, say, and then in that day you put bullet points that are your things you're going to do that day. And the difference between this and a normal just to do list is that a to do list and I fell into this trap very badly is that your to do list goes on forever. You never get the feeling of like finishing your to do list because you're always adding stuff to it. Right. It's every day. It's like, oh, yeah, right. I got to do this, too. Oh, I'm going to schedule that for next week. Let me put that on my to do list, whatever it is. And so you're always there's always something to do. And it's hard. Like Dedeker said, it's hard to feel like I can stop now. Like I can I can leave my work at work now and just have my day that that's really hard to do because there's always something else on the to do list. Yeah. And the idea with the bullet journal is as those things come up. You put them on a backlog and then you look through your bullet journal and you go, huh, what day could I fit this into? So you'd look through your bullet journal and go, oh, you know what? I actually don't have a lot of things going on this Friday. Let me add it there. Or, oh gosh, this week I've got a lot of stuff. I know it'd be cool to get this done, but if I schedule this for next Monday or next Friday or whatever, then I know I'll have time for it. And basically the idea is you kind of learn to schedule an amount of things each day that you can actually get done. And maybe you won't always, and you've got to move things to the next day, but the goal is to get good enough at knowing what you can get done 
so that every day you get to finish it. And what's so cool about it for me as someone who can fall into that trap of just like, oh, getting productivity and getting stuff done is more important than my well-being. That uh, what's so great about it is when I finish that bullet journal, I'm like, well, I could start doing stuff for days later or now I could play video games or I could go work out or I can just take a nap or, you know, whatever it is that this is my time now. And I find for people who don't have just that nine to five, or even if you do, and you end up getting bogged down with like household chores, it's a way to give yourself a set amount. So anyway, this one for me has been life changing. Like no, I, I can't even, I can't even exaggerate that. This has been so no, it, it legitimately has. Cause for me as someone who really wraps up their self-worth in productivity and it feels guilty about not being productive. Uh-huh. It really has changed my life in the sense that <laughs> instead of it being, yeah, this endless to-do list where I could always be doing something more, I could always be doing something more, I could always be doing something more instead of relaxing. It's really helped me to be able to kind of set it and forget it to a certain extent and compartmentalize it so that then it frees me up to then be able to relax and be present when I'm with my partners, especially. Yeah. And then like Emily so, was saying, that yeah. thing about like, oh gosh, wait, what do I have to do still? That it's like, I've got it done. Or if it's not today, I'm like, it's okay, your, yeah. I've put it somewhere. So I know it's taken care of. So I don't have to have that like extra mental load of stressing about, ooh, what else do I have to do? You just put it on yeah. a day. Yeah, but don't take our word for it. <laughs> Go to your Google machine and look up Bullet Journal or Bullet Journal Trello and see if this is a good option for you. I highly recommend it. So we're going to move on to single tasking. Uh, And this one is not just about efficiency, but it's also about quality of life because research shows that up to 40% of a person's productive time is spent on switching between tasks and not actually doing them. And I did want to say one specific thing regarding, (laughs) yes, I know. Crazy, right? Yeah, no, amazing. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I did want to say some specific thing about single tasking is that I've heard a way of doing this, which may be slightly different than bullet journals or various other things, but that is to write down like the six tasks that you need to do in a day. And you start with like the number one task goes at the top and then you, mm. you know, do the the next yeah. six or whatever for the day and that you don't move on to the next task until the first one is done. And so that's if great. you don't yeah. get all of them finished in a day, that's OK. It can move on to the next day, kind of like what you were saying about the bullet journal. But if, you know, you you at least have that like one very important task that needs to get done and that one will happen and you need to finish that before you move on to any of the other ones. So I think that that does kind of go along with this thing of single tasking because you make sure at least that your main focus occurs during that day when you need it to. Yeah. I love that. That's a great technique for for yeah, like that, that idea of like kind of forcing yourself into single tasking by being like, yes, I can't move to this thing yet until I finish this first thing. That's, that's, a, yeah, could be a good way to do It's an interesting way of doing it. Yeah. But it, it does like, it, <laughs> and I think that you can utilize things like Pomodoro's or various other methods with this one, mm-hmm. but in order to kind of get you through that task, especially if it's a potentially daunting one or like you need to write, uh, whatever I, you know, I spent, um, maybe a, an hour and a half or so writing out, copy for something that we're doing uh, in the near future. And I just kind of had to get it done. And I was like, okay, this is the first thing on my to-do list. And I, I just kind of barreled through it. And it was, it, and I didn't move on from any, from that until I got it finished. And it was productive because I knew like I could singly focus on that one thing before moving on. Yeah. So, so, okay. I, I know that like busyness, multitasking is also something that I think carries a lot of bragging rights or people will have a lot of yeah. pride in their ability to multitask. And the thing is, unfortunately for, for those people, and I, I was one of these people, um, <laughs> the, the research just doesn't back it up. It just doesn't yeah. that like Dedeker was saying about taking so long to get back to the task that you we're working on when you get distracted by a text message or by social media or something like that, 
that, um, and, and like Emily said, research showing up to 40% of a person's productive time is spent on switching between tasks rather than actually doing them. And what was really interesting in looking into this research a little bit more for this episode is that there's two different things that take up a lot of your time and also your mental energy. And so one of them is the one that I think is more understandable, which is, right, I'm working on writing a paper and then I'm multitasking by also, I don't know, cleaning my room or I'm also texting or I'm also trying to plan date night for this week or, you know, whatever it is, I'm also doing another thing. There's time that your brain takes to kind of reset the rule set that it's working in, right? So I'm writing the paper and my brain's in, okay, these are the things I'm thinking about. This is the research I have. I've, I've got that. And I'm, my brain's kind of, you know, in the shape of a paper <laughs> as it were. <laughs> what? Right. I, science. <laughs> That's science. Yeah. And then I switch to scheduling something, you know, texting and scheduling something that now my brain has to kind of switch to like, okay, now let's sort of unload those thoughts and reload the like, okay, this is my schedule coming up. This is the goal I'm trying to achieve. This is who I'm talking to. This is the relationship. This is how I'm talking to them, all that, right? It's kind of like you kind of have to like unload the one program and load up the other to start working on that. And then you're switching back and forth. That loading time is end up taking up your time. So that's the one I think that most people get. They're like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've had that experience of like, takes a second to get into the mindset. But research has shown that another big time sink that gets missed in a lot of the research, because the research will dictate, okay, you do this task and then, okay, now stop, do this other task. Okay, now stop, go back, do that other task. Okay, now stop, do this other thing. That they're measuring that and seeing that time. But what they're missing is that in real life, we're the ones deciding when to switch tasks or deciding I get this text. Do I respond now? Or do I respond later? I -hmm. see this email. Do I answer this now? Or do I schedule it for later? And that we're constantly, if we're allowing ourselves to multitask, we're not only switching between the tasks, but we're also doing this like managerial overhead of deciding when and if to switch tasks, which I have found that once I learned that I was like, oh my gosh, now it makes sense. Cause I found Mm. that maybe, maybe I am good at multitasking. Research says I'm not, but say, even if I am, (laughs) I find that when I multitask, my quality of life goes down significantly. That I I feel more like after an eight hour work day, of also trying to text with people and schedule things and respond to emails and plan a multi emory episode while also doing like a normal nine to five type job. I leave that time feeling mentally exhausted and like emotionally exhausted and just worn down from it. And probably also not getting all of those things done, right? Or at least not as well. Uh, then if I were as opposed to those times where I really like get in the zone on something, whether I'm programming or I'm writing something or I'm editing something when I'm just sort of like in the zone and I get done with that and I'm like pumped. Like I feel energized from that singular focus. Uh, and that, that for me was this like, Oh, it's that it's the, it's the overhead. It's like the manager brain that's getting tired from having to make those decisions. Mm, yeah. That makes total sense. It's like that mental load. Yeah. That yeah. is really not serving us or helping us. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> well, I'm depressed. Oh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's going to be all no, right. <laughs> it's true that I, I have been in the last few months, really been trying to push myself toward less multitasking and more, focusing and and I I do I get that kind of that same thing like that that rush that flow you know Mm -hmm. it does feel really really nice yeah yeah it's like Uh, sometimes hard to find those moments but when you do it's just it's great like butter Butter. Uh, so the last tool or practice that we're going to throw at you again this is not a comprehensive list but the last one we got here is to turn off your notifications or batch them on your phone, essentially. So as in, if you're in the middle of either a task or something like a date night or time with your partner, like 
switch on do not disturb switch you know go onto airplane mode or whatever provided that the people in your life understand that this is a thing that's going to be happening um or if you have uh you know notifications that are coming in during the day while you're trying to work you know find time to batch them all together so sometimes during a work day what i'll do is like any message i get through facebook messenger unless it's like from a partner of mine who's like about to go to bed or something like that like I just kind of snooze all those notifications until the end of the day and then I sit down and respond to them all at once um it just makes it a lot easier again it's kind of um you know there's less mental load because my brain is not juggling like all these different conversations while also trying to figure out my own tasks and stuff like that um and bear in mind the the purpose of this is to maximize your focus and especially though to maximize your quality time with your partners and not just to be more productive um i think that this can be so important even with something as simple as just hanging out with your partner and watching a movie i know it's so easy these days um, um, actually, a friend of mine who worked in marketing was talking about, I forget what, there's a fancy marketing term for it, but it's basically the phenomenon of like watching a show while also being on your phone, like consuming dual media at the same time that this mm. person that I knew in his marketing job was saying that like research is showing that this is happening more and more and more and more and more. And so that's why people, you know, marketers are learning to take advantage of that in a certain way, either in the way they design their ads to draw your eye or even trying to have synchronized ads, things that pop up on your phone and on the TV screen at the same time. Like we're going to start seeing more of that. But but basically, like you don't have to do that. And so especially when it's quality time with your partner, even if the two of you are focusing on something like a TV show or Netflix or whatever, you know, you can also turn off your phone. Like like avoiding the dual media consumption, I think is huge as well cuz you're probably going to enjoy your media that you are consuming much more than <laughs> yeah. than two forms of media kind of half-assedly enjoyed at the same time. So, we want to thank you all for being with us today during all of these productivity hacks and scheduling uh, tips and tricks. And we hope that you got something out of it. Um, in the bonus episode, we're going to rant about some of the more unproductive times in our lives. And also maybe some productivity tips that actually blow that we've gotten before. Because there are a lot out there that actually don't help people very much. So we want to know how you do your scheduling and productivity if you find yourself to be a very productive person, if you're kind of like me and a little bit more loosey-goosey about it, if you have partners in your life who are more like Dedeker or like very, very stringent about like everything needs to be scheduled to a T, uh, we want to know about that. So the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. Leave us a vo voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-0-5, or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Jace Lundgren, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balbonetta. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistants are Rachel Schenewerk and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. <laughs>